Okay, so I think it's time to start. So people should have already joined. So we are 21 people. So thanks a lot for joining and uh, welcome to the Young People's Program Career Panel. Okay, so this is the session to discuss about career perspective and um, different career choices that hopefully it's going to be very interesting for you, for all the uh, participants at the Young People's Program. So we have an outstanding uh, panels of uh, really high level people. So let's go for it. So, so first of all, I just wanted to ask you, how many of you are uh, graduate students? Maybe you can use the chat to answer, or you can like uh, connect your camera one moment and raise the hands. Yeah. So how many master students? Yeah. How many are having a PhD? Yeah. Also panelists. <laughs> okay. How many are working in a company? Okay, so we got some insights. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Javier Salazar. I am uh, strategy support and innovation manager at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and I'm providing support for talent and career related activities at the High Peak uh, Network and uh, Coordinated and Support Action. So, first of all, a bit of disclaimer. I know that it's late, but I think here we have a very interesting chance to interact with people. So, don't be shy. Don't be shy. So uh, we would recommend to open the cameras to share like your faces, your feelings, what your smiles, your reactions. Uh, at any time, feel free to add and post any questions on the on the Zoom chat. Uh, we will go through the questions and try to answer. Uh, as well, uh, you can also ask them with the audio and uh, you can also feel free to comment and to, uh, to, to also interact. Uh, and what to say, the panelists are really, really, really high level. So you really have a privilege to be at uh, such a session. So uh, make use of it. And uh, one last comment, this session is going to be recorded. Uh, so the main name is that uh, not only you could uh, at the end of the day uh, benefit from what is said in the session, but as well that, uh, that uh, we can share it and spread the word a bit more across more people. Okay, so first, have you ever thought why you do what you do? So why you started a PhD? Why you started studying? Have you ever thought what else is there? So maybe one part of the session, so this, uh, the panelists that we have, uh, have very diverse career paths. So we aim to help you to broaden the scope and to maybe teach you uh, which other possibilities you have or you could have other than 
completing the, the PhD or like doing a paper or doing like a, what you are doing like a, to please the supervisor. So I will start with a small introduction on Hypeak and then uh, I will let give the word to the panelists and uh, we'll have uh, different rounds and explaining who they are and how they got there and how what they would recommend you and anytime ask interact okay so high peak i will fly through what is high peak i don't know if uh, you are already aware of what is it if you joined because of uh, us that we are we were uh, announcing this session or if you still don't know so high peak is the network of uh, european experts in advanced computing uh, high performance embedded architecture and compilation okay uh, high peak has been a key element for computer science researchers to help them in the career growth and uh, we have uh, many many activities that are helping in all the stages of your career so since you are starting in uh, while you are a student or even not even uh, yet a phd student uh, we organize activities for you to engage and to help you to grow in your careers uh, we usually organize uh, different flagship events per year so our main event is the conference uh, more than 600 people researchers are joining every year to try to share their insights we have the computing systems week so it's a bit smaller event like around 150 people joining and uh, with a bit uh, closer interaction between people workshops are organized and a lot of knowledge shared and there is a summer school this is usually the entry point for students but we have many other activities okay for students you can check them from the website uh, and the activities are organized in each of the of the events so we have uh, an activity a stem day at the high peak conference we invite a group of students to join for free the conference and to follow like all the activities of the of the uh, conference and to we organize some specific tailored activities for you we are also organized at the computing systems week so at uh, the next uh, computer si uh, computing systems week we have a student challenge now it could be a bit late to join but you could check it it's uh, taking place next week and if you are uh, close to finland you could consider it uh, we also have some career session and uh, we organize internships it could be interesting for you to if you are in the academia to also share and to join and get some insights from the industry we have a jobs portal more than 300 opportunities uh, main companies in the area are using it and we use the jobs portal as well for date career fair so i don't know if you had the chance to use it if not i think you still can apply for them so there are more than 82 openings and if you want to become to join high peak you can tell your supervisor to become member or just uh, join so thanks a lot and let's start with the career panel so that was all about high peak so who are you so maybe we can start with anna so. Hello, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Yes, first of all, I would like to thank you for thinking of me for this <laughs> event. I am currently being the project officer of the Hypic project, so I'm quite aware of the initiatives and tasks and all the, the, the tasks you are doing within the project. So I know the impact and the network you are, you are, you are moving. Um, well, yes, I mean, I'm working as project officer now for, for the HADIA, a European Commission Agency. 
Um, I started working for commission in 2018, but uh, before I, I also had a life. <laughs> I, yes, I'm a computer engineer. I did a master's and then I did a PhD. Um, why a PhD? Uh, because at the moment, you don't realize what's going to be in the future for you. But then the PhD opens some doors that if you don't have it, they are not there. At least this has been my experience. Of course, if you directly end up um, your degree and start uh, working in the industry, could also be fine. I've also known um, uh, in industrial PhDs uh, that can be done inside uh, uh, the industry. But, um, well, um, I didn't plan <laughs> to come here, but to come here means to start working for the European Commission. But I must say that um, when you finish studying your degree at university and you keep on doing an, an academic uh, path over there and you start doing research, um, normally these funds come from somewhere and sometimes they are really attached to uh, European funded projects. So you start having uh, really uh, close contact with, with European Commission if you, if you do a PhD, if, if it's not an industrial one. But um, yes, I started knowing the European Commission from, from the very beginning. Uh, then I, I got the chance to work in the industry for a for a cutting edge uh, uh, technology uh, research company, and after that I had the opportunity to come to work for the commission and to see how uh, this uh, research is seen from the other side, and gives you the opportunity to understand a bit uh, deeper what's the policy attached to all this research that you have been doing since you finished your degree. So yeah, this has been my path and this has been my professional life. Um, yeah, since I become an engineer. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Anna. So and uh, welcome here and thanks a lot for joining and support. So next one, Alba Cervera. From the Hello Barcelona. everyone, good evening. And uh, yeah, I would also like to, to thank the organizers to, to organize and to host this, this kind of, of, of meeting. So it's I believe it's really important to, to show different experiences because in the end nobody follows exactly the same path. Um, and then that's interesting. So in my case, I'm a physicist, so I study physics. Um, and then when I finished my degree, I did a master in particle physics. So it's something super theoretical, uh, academic oriented, etc. So my goal since the beginning was to pursue a PhD, but in theoretical physics. What happened is at the middle of my degree and later of my master thesis, I just discovered the field of quantum information science. And because of that, I just started doing research in that direction. I became super interested on that. So I decided to start a PhD instead of theoretical physics and in something with more applications in the short term, uh, well, with more applications beyond physics, which is uh, quantum information in general. And, but it's still theoretical. So what's, uh, what happens to me is at the middle years of my PhD, so after the first year, uh, quantum computers became available in the cloud, which means that uh, my work was not theoretical anymore. And I, ha I had the opportunity to test some of the algorithms if I wanted to, to design these algorithms in, in the cloud. And because of that, I ended my PhD focusing more on quantum computation instead of the wild field of quantum information. So after that, I, I started to become an expert in quantum computation in particular and on managing the quantum algorithms in the cloud. So basically, I had the opportunity to, to run experiments in my laptop, literally. 
Uh, so I decided to continue in academia as it was my general goal anyway, to stay in academia. And I moved to Toronto to do my, I did my postdoctoral studies there, also in the same field. And recently I came back to, to, to Spain, to BSc, where I ended my, my PhD a few years ago. Uh, to work again in quantum computation and also to manage the quantum spin project, which is a quite ambitious project that uh, that tries to, to to spread the word of the, let's say of quantum computation in, in Spain in particular. And we will have a quantum computer in, in Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and and my job is to help uh, that to happen and to manage the, the full team of people. And also at the same time, I'm trying to, to find some time to, to continue with my, my research projects, which focus on, on algorithms. So basically I always want, in my case, I always wanted to have a PhD. So, so it was quite clear. What wasn't clear is the field. So basically, as I said, I was thinking about particle physics and something super theoretical from a physical point of view, but I ended up, uh, doing something that has more applications directly. So I, I'm programming quantum computers, which is something that I never think about a few years ago. So many things change. And I think it's uh, what it's important is to, to I, and I, I guess that we can talk about this later, to have the, um, the ability to, to adapt to new situations in this case, because you never know uh, which are the, the applications of the future or what are the new trends in the future. So it's really important that you keep your mind open in, in that direction. And that's what I did. And, and I'm super happy currently in my, in my current position. So thanks a lot. So really hands-on experience from a passion towards research. Uh, so next one, so we jump from research to academia, to the university. So welcome, Ari Kulmala. Yes, thanks. So yeah, my name is Ari Kulmala. Um, maybe a little bit less in the academia actually, but, but uh, currently I work as a professor of practice at Tampere University. That's my, my kind of like part-time job. And then uh, I'm actually working for uh, Technology Innovation Institute in, in Abu Dhabi um, there for a few months. And I was thinking, thinking that question, how did you get there? So there is, there is quite some path. So I'll start from the beginning. And, and then um, <clears throat> I first of all started studying, uh, studying embedded systems. I was actually rather interested in, in software side of things and how in low level things work, but then, then got um, <clears throat> touches of digital design and, and started to do uh, system on chip based um, uh, studies and, and, and wanted to always understand more and more how things work, why they work and how, how we can do better. And I was very ambitious and, uh, since I, there was a good chance to work at the university at the same place where I was studying, I, I started to pers pursue also the PhD. But it was always clear to me that I will end up in the industry after that. So I was looking for the kind of like full academic career. So after I got my um, PhD, I started in Nokia, the mobile phone side. And I was very curious of all the information that I was suddenly getting being in the industry when you could see the kind of like phone programs and what all is around the SOC, what are the kind of like commercial aspects of things, why things are being done and all the complications about productizing things and so on. And uh, from, from Nokia, I worked there in a wireless modem, which was sold to Renesas Electronics. So I changed to a semiconductor company, which again taught a lot of new kind of things that when you are actually developing the chips for living, you're not developing the chips for internal customer. Um, there is certain kind of like passion to get the ICs out and, uh, and you really kind of like get, get down to the technologies itself. Just, well, of course, those kind of big semiconductor houses, they, they do pretty much everything in house. And um, from Renaissance Electronics, I switched to Nokia, but this time again, but this time to the infrastructure side where 
instead of handling mobile ASICs, which are which are small and, and uh, low power, uh, we switch to kind of like, in a sense, m much more massive uh, SOCs for in yeah, infrastructure where power is important, but it's, it's not kind of like in a similar level than in mobile mobile devices and and that gave me a lot of a lot of new opportunities to to work in the radio domain in the uh, baseband domain but also in the data center domain with fpgas with asics with uh, virtualized hardware resources and, and everything and really kind of like needed to get out of the yeah well out of the comfort zone to be able to grab grab that all and um, I've been in kind of like organization leading position and, and individual contributor positions. And, and then at some point of time in Nokia, we started to think there that the need for the SOC engineers overall, it, it, was, it was huge. And uh, there definitely needs to be more push also here in Finland for uh, more engineers, more education in the area. And so we started this SOC hub initiative. Uh, at the same time, when I got the professorship from the Tampere University, and um, and I've been basically run, running that with my my colleagues now for uh, officially like a couple of years, but of course there is a, some preparation work before that also, and um, I've now been a couple of years in Tampere University and switched jobs a couple of times on the side, so the main job changed from, from Nokia to Nordic Semiconductor when, where I switched back to a semiconductor uh, IC business again, started a site in, in, in Tampere for digital IC, a bit more kind of like startup culture. And now, like I said, I, I've now again made a change when there was a great chance to, to kind of like build something new for, for a while. So it's... There is the last question. Did you plan it or did it just happen? So I, I think the reality picture is pretty good. And the next step when you are taking it, it might seem obvious, but you don't know it before it can, comes to you. OK, thanks a lot. So a lot of uh, experiences and uh, different experiences. So uh, you can you will be able to share a lot of insights later as well and a lot of recommendations oh, so <laughs> let's uh, jump fast to antonia because time is running very fast and uh, so welcome here yeah. again i i try to be quick hi i'm antonia <laughs> um i'm currently working at sprint sprint uh, which is uh, the German Federal Agency for Disruptive Innovation, founded two years ago and tries to be the German DARPA, just without the D for defense. <laughs> um, and the agency currently gets quite a lot of political um, attention and funding of money. So I'm looking forward to what will happen in the next years. Um, I, I am a physicist. I did a PhD because people said, as a physicist, you have to do a PhD if you want to get a job afterwards. Um, but also because I really wanted to nerd around a bit. I worked in a really huge Max Planck Institute for quantum optics lab. We did uh, laser-driven particle accelerations with huge lasers, huge vacuum chambers, a lot of money. It was really fun. Um, what I really enjoyed about it is that it touched many different areas of physics, like particle acceleration, plasma physics, whatever. Um, but in the end, I really, uh, first of all, stayed too many nights overnight in the lab, 24 hour shifts till the experiment was running. Uh, and I really didn't really believe that what we did would make it somewhere at some point uh, to something useful I'd say um, so what I did afterwards more or less planned was move to a, a company that consults the governments about technology research funding actually um, and there I worked in the areas of microelectronics, electronics, later on, on, on design automation and also lithography. Um, 
and I really liked about it that you get you you get to see a lot of projects, a lot of problems in the world, engineering problems. You see the problems, and a few year, years later, you get the results presented and so the solutions. So this is the detail level I really liked, and I liked how broad you can be with the, what you observe. Um, and from there on, I I went to to Sprint where I am right now which is um, trying to get technology to the market. So it tries to do really innovation, which means just it's research that arrived in the market. So it's trying to, to bridge that valley of death where technology doesn't make it to the market. So like this, I mean, what what I didn't plan, but what happened is that I moved from really basic research to closer to the market but not doing it myself and right now we're working with a lot of venture capital i don't know it like in this area and it's really interesting so so thanks thanks a lot so you can see out of uh, phd like uh, deep tech studies how many diversity of possibilities you have so just think yourself um, did you ever imagine that uh, there could be so many diff uh, different choices or you just imagined like uh, teaching at the university or like uh... so that, that, that there's a picture this picture below that uh, i always like sharing because you always you might have like some ideas in your mind but then when it comes to reality so everything can happen so let's move and uh since uh it's getting late maybe we had three rounds but we will make it into two rounds okay and we will try to wrap it up so that we could get uh, some questions if possible uh, i have one question in the chat so i will uh, go through after this round so uh i would like to focus into questions so which differences there are between the different choices or the different careers, uh, how the PhD made this possible, and which were the skills and attitudes that you think that are needed for those. So uh, shall we start with uh, Alba Cervera with uh, so what was the first question sorry how can a phd help to make a... so it it, uh, it was like uh, the challenges differences between the different career paths so maybe mm -hmm. in your case it's, uh, you mm -hmm. went into research so you can talk about the research and the phd mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah indeed so my my career path was always has been always academia so far although to be honest, recently I've been in contact with many companies because uh, we are working in a quite novel field. So that means that many companies, uh, and I think that's also happening with other technologies, are investing in, in, uh, in doing and are doing research in these, in these other fields, which means that sometimes you don't need to stay in academia to continue with your research. And I believe that we have many examples here about that, so, so which is also interesting. So to me, the big challenge, uh, which is still a current challenge, is the stability in academia, to stay in academia. Because basically you have to jump from one job to another, you your job depends on a project, et cetera. So you don't have this uh, stability or achieving this stability is quite hard until you become a professor. On the other side, it's, it's quite fun because you are you know, changing your project and you're always learning new things. So sometimes it's quite demanding in terms of time. But as, as long as you, you can keep this uh, work balance uh, as, uh, as better as possible, which is not always the case, unfortunately, but we should all work on that direction, to be honest, uh, it's quite fun. So I really enjoy it. And, uh, and in that case, of course, a PhD helped me to, to make this possible because it was the only way to stay in academia is becoming a, a doctor and then continue with postdoc, etc which is not necessarily the case in, in companies, as I believe that some of my colleagues can, can comment. And the last question was, sorry. Um, 
So the attitudes and skills that are okay, necessary. Yeah. To... In terms of skills, I already mentioned that before. Um, be open-minded and, uh, and being able to adapt to new situations. Uh, because that happens all the time with this disruptive and, uh, and innovative field. So you never know what is the technology of the future, which means that maybe you have to learn a, a completely, not a completely new field, but something super new. So you need to uh, be able to adapt to these uh, novelties. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's important. The other important point is to, to work collaboratively with other people. Because you will never do research alone. That's completely, that doesn't exist. So there is, there doesn't exist a genius that does absolutely everything. Basically, because this technically genius has to collaborate with other people, has to manage grants, has to uh, manage and give talks, etc. So you basically, you are surrounded by a team of people that will help you with that. So you need to be someone that uh, likes to collaborate with other people and with, with others with completely different backgrounds and you all understand each other. So I, I believe that's a very important skill to, to take into account, but especially being open-minded because that's, uh, that's to me the most important thing if you want to continue in research in academia, which is my particular path. Okay, so thanks a lot. So we move to next. Uh... Maybe we can follow on with uh, Ari. Okay. And uh, as well, we got a very interesting question. And uh, well, I, I will pick the question on the fly so as, as you talk. Okay, so uh, first of all, challenges, differences, and uh, similarities. And, uh, and as well, well, we have 10 minutes left for 11 minutes left for the session. Yeah. So. We should try to keep it short. I was telling it was a yeah, short yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. it's... So uh, I think one of the kind of like big differences is that in, in the industry, typically good enough is good enough. Whereas in research, you always want to kind of like find the last optimization that you can make it even better. So maybe that that's a that's something that's that's different. And um, I, I surely think that Definitely, it's it's possible to move between between these roles, and 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 it, it probably grows the expertise. You will understand better the both sides of the of the thing. And um, from the kind of like a PhD studies point of view, I think the PhD studies give a lot. Kind of like you you need you kind of like need to create this kind of systematic approach. You get presentation skills. Um, then you actually you need to prepare slides. You need to be able to tell your message in a short time, etc. These are very very uh, good skills also in the industry. Okay, so uh, and uh, maybe you are also a good person to also answer Rafael's question, like uh, the pros and cons to follow a very specialized path versus changing a lot like uh, if this could be seen as something negative as well or uh, at, at least for me I, I don't think that there is there is uh, a negative tone in that because there are always people that are super expert very deep experts on something and then there are people that are kind of like all around good but not kind of like deeply in some subject and, and actually you need both you need people that really kind of like deeply understand things and then then you need need people that like from the industry point of view you can kind of like throw into different kind of challenges and they will go with those and get things done so uh, I, I i think it's and if, if i read the question correctly it was that the uh, there was chains of different kind of tasks often so i would at least think that it's rich experience rather than a burden. <laughs> okay, thanks for your insight. So maybe we can jump to Antonia. Yeah, so maybe I just uh, add to, to this. I mean, I, I at least in my last job, I also did hire people and um, this has never been a problem um, as long as you could explain why you you why you ended one job one jump to the next right i mean it's it's always as as, as uh, adi just said it's important to have people who have a lot of 
different experiences with a large network of people. It is also what you get with if you jump around in, in your on your job and experiences. You get to know a lot of people you can later on rely on. Um, you you get to know the experts you can ask, uh, but of course that depends on what you do. So for instance, the, my more or less consulting jobs, I'd say this is exactly what you want, um, as long as you can always give a good reason why this job ended. Um, and this is this is I think this is also or, or one of the the similarities in in all the, all these areas is that you do need all these soft skills like you, you need to know how to manage projects you need to know how to talk to people how to build and maintain a network um, so there are quite a few things that are that, that these areas have in common yeah so that's, that's a very good point i think because uh, you learn you can learn something out of everything you do and, uh, that you can apply to other areas. So that's always uh, continuous learning. So uh, maybe we can jump to Anna and uh, we have five minutes left. Okay, so if I may add something to mm -hmm. what already has been said, I will start on how a PhD can help to make this possible. So in my <laughs> opinion, I believe that a PhD can help you work in an SME, in an R&D company, in, in the academia, in a big multinational. Because when you do a PhD, you learn a lot on your field of research, of course, but your mind changes. That's my opinion. I mean, you, you, you learn a lot on a concrete topic. But you learn how to sum up, how to summarize, how to, you, you have an, an analytical mind that you didn't have before. I mean, your mind changes the way, when you start the PSD and when you end your PSD, you're not the same person, I would say. <laughs> because you are much more analytical. You have a different structure in your mind. And this will walk you through whatever you decide to do. If you go to the NSME, if you go to a company, you go to academia, Sometimes it's nice to have a path and to have an ideal, but sometimes life's, life moves you <laughs> and walks you through something. So I would say to uh, this um, uh, student that just posted a, a question that, first of all, don't be afraid because that's who you are and it's never known. But uh, I would say that you have a lot if you have done a PhD because this is not an easy thing for me and this could help you in in opening many many doors it's my humble opinion that's completely true so that, that is one of the takeaway messages that uh, i could uh, think about is this don't be afraid to try out things and you learn a bit of everything you do so that's uh some great takeaway message okay uh another another takeaway message that uh, i think it was popped up or thrown is like the phd like it really helps you to develop like it changes you it changes your mind and uh, it teaches not only a lot about the topic that you are researching but it also teaches like how to do many other stuff, like uh, as you were saying, like uh, how to sum up things, how to present, how to comply with uh, with deadlines, how to do the things on your own, like uh, without, like with minor supervision. Supervisors are always busy, so you really, really learn a lot of things that are useful in all the worlds. So that's uh, usually a very, very, very nice step. And uh, another takeaway message, as you were mentioning, like uh, doing a PhD is not easy at all. So it's really challenging time. And uh, that's something that uh, once you 
got there. So it's something to be proud of as well and to be like to, to put it into value also for your inner yourself. Uh, so it's a really good thing to do. So we are like two minutes before the end of the session. So I would like to thank all the panelists for this uh, time in the evening. And I would like to thank as well all the attendees as well to join for this time. And uh, we usually like to do a bit longer so that normally people get start being less shy as questions start like moving on. So we will not have the time for this this time. As well, when, when we organize this session at the summer school, it's also nice because you normally keep on discussing and then you go for some drinks and you keep on discussing for longer time. So as for this short time, uh, hopefully you enjoyed these insights and these uh, great messages from great people. And uh, well, hopefully you will keep some of this idea as well. We will help you to broaden the scope to as well be proud of uh, what you are doing and uh, to be sure that you will have a lot, a lot of uh, many opportunities in the future. So thanks a lot for the attendance and uh, well, thanks especially for all the panelists, for all the support and uh, everything. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have a nice evening. Thanks a lot.